Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Apostle, and we're welcoming you to another broadcast. And we're looking forward to getting into the Word and sharing with you again what God has been teaching to us the last, oh, four or five weeks. And I am just really excited about this series of messages that God has been giving us. And I just pray that you will continue to walk in the authority and the anointing that God has given you as we approach the Word and as we receive revelation knowledge from the Word of God. I believe that as we continue to minister the truth, then we will see the manifestations of what God wants us to have in our lives. And so we're looking forward again to getting into the word and, and just blessing Jesus and blessing God. Praise God. Let's pray. And then we're going to get into the word and see what the Lord has to say to us today. As we continue on the series, prosperity, God's way. Father, we just thank you again for your blessings that are upon us. We thank you for your love and your kindness and your goodness and your mercy that you've shown us. And now, Father, as we approach your word, we ask that our great teacher, the Holy Spirit, would rule and reign through this service. I pray that revelation knowledge will flow freely from my lips. I bind my flesh so that I will speak nothing but truth, no opinion, but just the word of God. We thank you right now, Lord, that your, your people's hearts are ready to receive fertile ground and they shall receive this word and it shall bring forth an unlimited full return. We bind Satan in every act of deception, every, every act that he would try to do to disrupt. And we release the glory and the anointing of God to move mightily in this service as we get into the word of God. We pray also, Father, that as the word is going forth, that signs, wonders, miracles, healings, gifts of healings, deliverances, salvation will break through in the lives of those that are listening now or those that will be listening to this at a later date. We release the anointing of God for supernatural wonders and signs to manifest itself now as we approach the word. And Father, we thank you in advance for what you're about to do in Jesus name. Amen. Praise God. Well, praise God, everybody. We're looking forward to the word and we're looking forward to getting into the word so that the truth of God can manifest itself in our midst and in our lives. Praise the name of Jesus. Well, we've been talking about prosperity and dealing with prosperity from the word of God. Now we know that there has been a lot of false teaching and misteaching concerning prosperity and people have used it to abuse uh, what the word says and, and try to manifest it so that it can give them personal gain. Now we need to understand, even though there have been false teaching about prosperity, the Bible is very specific about what God wants you and I to have. And we have seen as we have gone through these messages that God really wants you to prosper and to be blessed and to have abundance. He wants you to be abundantly blessed. Now, we understand, as I've been sharing with you, that because we have grown up in our lives and we've never really lived or appropriated the type of lifestyle that God really has purchased for us through the blood of Jesus. And therefore, when we begin to hear what the Bible is actually saying to us about how he really wants us to live and the covenant of prosperity that he has released to us, it can be very difficult to grasp your mind around it and understand it so that you can actually receive it and operate in faith for it in your own personal life. And so when the strongholds of poverty and the, pro the strongholds of average living have been released into our lives for so long, then we have to renew our minds and we have to warfare with the word of God in order to renew our minds to the truth of God's word. So I'm, I'm believing God that the anointing of God shall break through every yoke of bondage and that you and I will receive revelation, knowledge, and truth like we've never received it before. So I'm looking forward to getting into the word. Let's get into the word and see what God has to say to us right now in Jesus name. Now we've been talking about prosperity and we really uh, went to Genesis chapter 12, where the Bible taught us that God had blessed Abraham and he said that he would bless him and he would be a blessing and in him should all the families of the earth be blessed. 
and and we understand the blessing that God had given Abraham. Now we we found out also in um, Galatians that the the book of Galatians teaches us that Christ has died for us on the cross, and because of that. He has made it possible for the blessing of Abraham to come on the Gentiles through faith in Christ Jesus. So we found out that whatever God had promised Abraham in his blessings of Abraham, that very blessing and those blessings are also for you and I, because we are in Christ and Christ has purchased those for us. We've gone over those uh, verses of scripture. So we want to move on today and see where we're, we're going to go. Now let's pick up where we uh, started and left off last week. Let's go to Genesis chapter 14 and remember what the Bible teaches us that Abraham's prosperity also includes tithing. Abraham's prosperity also includes tithing. So we need to understand this and, and we're going to get into the word and we're going to really break this down where we're going to show you how God's word really manifests itself in our lives. Look at Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Now in Genesis chapter 14, verse 14, the Bible says something that is very interesting. And it says, and when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he, watch this now, he, this is so interesting. And, and what happened? He, he armed his trained servants. Now remember, we've always talked about Abraham as being the father of faith, but here Lot, who was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah had been overturned and overrun by another kingdom, and, and so now they had been taken captive. When Abraham hears that, the Bible says he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318. Now you have to understand something. Abraham took 318 men and he pursued them unto Dan. Now Abraham was going against Trelatomer and there were four kings. So there were four kingdoms and four armies that Abraham was going to deliver Lot and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah from. But he's only got 318 men and he's going to fight four armies. And the Bible said he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night and smote them and pursued, pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So we find Abraham doing something very miraculous. We find him doing something very powerful. And we, we, we don't really talk about Abraham when we're dealing with Abraham and really talk about Abraham as being a man of war. But Abraham was a man of faith, but he was also a man of war as we see here. The Bible says in verse 17, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Trelatomir and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Notice what the Bible says here. And he gave him tithes of all. Now, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who happened to be the high priest. Now, we, we also talk and share with you how this is more than likely a manifestation of Jesus uh, before he actually came into the earth as a uh, the son of God and the son of man. Now, the Bible says, and the king of Sodom said unto Abram, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said unto the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eshkol, Mamre, let them take their portions. So we find Abraham, in a war, winning the war, bringing the, the captives back, and now 
He pays tithes. I want you to understand this. Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek, as we find in, 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 in theology, is a type of Christ. I believe, and I think that the Bible really specifically shows us that he was a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because first of all, it says that Melchizedek was priest of the most high God. Now, we need to understand something. Nobody was worshiping God like that because God had called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees. There were no people really worshiping God, El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth. And therefore, here, here is Melchizedek, who's the king of Salem. Now, the, 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 ter the term Salem means peace. He was the king of peace. This sounds like the prince of peace, doesn't it to you and doesn't it to me? We also find in the scripture that the Bible describes uh, Melchizedek is having no mother and no father, no beginning. And so we need to understand something here that Abraham pays tithes. And this is what we want to talk about. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Uh, all right. Are y'all getting that? Okay. Now we dealt, oh, we dealt with this whole scenario last week. I just want to hit on that. Now let's go to the next verse and see what else happens. It says here, Jacob also tithed to God. So let's go to Genesis chapter 28 and see what happens there. And in Genesis chapter 28, verse 18, and notice what the Bible says. It says, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil up on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God be with me and keep me in this way that I go, I will get and will and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the 10th unto thee. So now we find Jacob giving tithe, promising to tithe to God. Now, what we need to understand here is because there, there is some erroneous teaching that is going around even in the body of Christ. And a lot of churches teach this now. Uh, they have gone away from the scripture, but they say that tithing is under the law. And since we are no longer under the law because Jesus broke the power of the law over us, therefore we are not required to tithe anymore. Now that is teaching that is going forth throughout the body of Christ. And I'm telling you, that is a big lie. That's just as big a lie. Well, it's even a bigger lie than the one Trump's telling about he won the election. But the mere fact is, it is a lie. It is an eternal lie. Because notice what we just saw. Did you not just see Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek? And did you not just see Jacob paying tithes unto uh, promising to pay tithes unto the Lord. Well, it's interesting because Abraham here, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek 430 years before the law was ever given. So how in the world could tithing be under the law when Abraham is paying tithes 430 years before the law was ever given? So tithing was never, never a part of the law as far as being instituted in the law. Tithing was instituted through faith. Abraham was justified by God by faith. And therefore, 430 years before the law even was in existence, Abraham was already paying tithe to God. And so we need to understand that tithing is an act of faith that you and I worship God with. Tithing is worshiping the Lord, and it is an act of faith. Tithing came through faith. Tithing did not come to, through the law. And we need to understand, and we're going to see that as we get into more scriptures later on throughout these teachings. But that's just a quick review of what we went through last, uh, last uh, Thursday. And today I want to take you into some very powerful areas. And I want you to understand this right now. Let's take a look at this next verse of scripture. And I want to ask this question, is tithing worship to God? Is tithing worship to God? 
Is tithing a part of worship? Well, let's take a look and see what the Bible says concerning tithing. Is tithing worship to God? All right, let's go to John chapter 4. St. John chapter 4, and we're going to take a look at St. John chapter 4 and see what the scripture says. Here in John chapter 4, verse 23 through verse 24, the Bible says something here that is very interesting and it is very powerful. And I want to break this down to you so that you can see exactly what God is saying to us because this is so powerful. The Bible says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth now the bible says here that god expects us to worship him in spirit and in truth. But now let's take a look at verse 23, because this is where we want to start off. It says, but the hour cometh and now is when the, you see that true worshipers, the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth. Now that word true there, uh, where it talks about true worshipers, that word true is the word aletheinos, and it means one who cannot lie. It means one who is real and who is genuine. And it means one who is conformed to the truth. So the mere fact here that God is talking about true worshipers, those are ones that cannot lie, that they have, they are adhering to the truth or the word of God. So if in fact God says that there are true worshipers, that also shows you and alerts you to the fact that if God says there are true worshipers, there are also false worshipers. And false worshipers have gotten into the church and they have corrupted the worship of God. Now we need to understand something as I as I begin to share this with you because we need to see what is worship. And when you ask most Christians, what is worship? They will tell you that worship is singing slow songs uh, to God in a church service. or if you're at home and you, and you start singing, you know, slow uh, songs uh, where you're singing them to God, that is only a part of worship. Worship and it's much bigger than that. And we're going to see that as we go along. But now let's take a look. Let's get back to that verse of scripture here so that you can see what God is talking about. It says that God, watch this now. He, he says, when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth. Now the Bible says, for the father seeketh such to worship him. And that word seek means he mean, he's seeking after. It means to strive to find something, and it means to look for something. Here we find that the Bible says God is actually looking for and striving to find and seeking after true worshipers. So that must mean if God's got to look for him and he's striving to find true worshipers, then that ought to let you know that maybe... Listen to what the word is saying. If God's got to strive, now you know God knows everything, but if he's striving and seeking to find true worshipers, that must let you know that true worshipers are a valuable commodity. And it also lets you know that there must be a whole lot of false worshipers out there because in fact, if God's got to search for true worshipers, if there was just only one set of worshipers, true worshipers, he would know true worshipers and he would see them. Now we understand that God is omnipotent and he's omniscient. He already knows everything. So when the Bible talks about he's seeking to find true worshipers and he's, he's searching for them, it's not that he's looking for them because he doesn't know where they are, but he is searching them out because he is showing them how he can take them and bring them to a new level of power and authority in him. 
He already, he's not seeking to find for himself. He's seeking true worshipers so that he can, so that we can understand that we've been found by God. And this is what he's doing. So he's looking for you. He's looking for me. He's looking for people that are going to stand and worship him in truth and they're going to worship him in spirit. So he is searching. You need to understand this is so powerful. God is searching for worshipers. And if he's searching for worshipers, what kind of indictment must that be to the church? Because a lot of this stuff that's going on in church is not worship. It is false worship being orchestrated and manipulated by the devil. And you need to understand that when we've got churches bringing in secular music to sing worship and praise, and we're bringing in secular artists, artists to sing and do concerts in the churches. And when we're playing secular music in the church and, and when we're doing worldly dancing in the church up on the altar and, and all of these different things, I want you to understand that the people of God are really committing acts of sin against God because they're giving him something that he never wants. He will never accept. God does not take the offering of the world and then you substitute that for his pure worship. The Bible said that a true worshiper is one that does not lie. A one that walks by the truth or walks in line with the truth. A true worshiper is going to worship the Lord the way God wants him to be worshiped. I hope y'all are hearing this. We're going to, it's going to get real good tonight. I'm, I'm trying to help you right now. Listen to what the word of God says here. Now the Bible says, that the father seeketh such to worship him. The word worship. Now this word here, worship is so powerful because when we're talking about worshiping the Lord, we're talking about doing something that is really, really powerful. That word worship is the word proscunio. And it comes from two words, pros meaning to, and cuneo meaning to kiss or to adore. And it walk, it actually talks about kissing up and, and adoring somebody. It, it talks about, about prostrating oneself before one who they honor and they adore. It calls and it talks about giving obeisance to someone. Now that word obeisance means actually to obey and to serve. So what in essence God is saying is he is looking for people to prostrate themselves and obey him and to serve him and to bless him and to kiss him and to honor him. It is an intimate relationship that God wants between us and him. It is that kind of relationship. See, when a person is, is actually proscunioing God, that means that you are not looking at God like he's your homeboy. You, you're not looking at God like he's the man upstairs. He is your creator. He is El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth. He is El Shaddai, the multiple breasted one the one who is more than enough. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is Jehovah Sitkanu, our righteousness. He is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. You understand he is the God that has come to deliver us and to bring us into congruence with him so that we can have his life. And therefore, because he is our creator and our possessor, then we are to prostrate ourselves before him. Now, there are more than one way to prostrate yourself before God. There's physically prostrating yourself before the Lord when you're actually laying on your face before God and honoring and blessing him. We do that many times in church services. How many times have you been in a church service and the power of God as you're singing and praising and, and giving God honor and worship and, and then you are on your knees or you fall to your face and you're blessing God and, and honoring God and praising him. That's one form of worship It's called physical prostration, but there are other forms of worship because that word worship also means to do obeisance and to be obedient means to be obedient and to serve. 
which means then now we see that there are more than one ways of worshiping God. Worship just not does not just entail singing songs to the Lord, the soft songs, the, the slow songs that make you weep and cry. That's part of it. But worship includes much more than that. As a matter of fact, when we're talking about worship, worshiping God means to serve God with your life, to submit your life to him and honor him and obey him by living according to his terms. Now that's what worship truly is. That is a true worshiper. There's a, anybody can get up and sing a slow song, but when God wants worship, he, he wants the, the singer of the song to have the lifestyle that the song is singing about. Come on and listen to what the word is saying. See, God wants you to obey him and to serve him and to prostrate yourself before him. Another way of prostrating yourself before the Lord is to mentally and spiritually prostrate yourself before God or to lay before God. What does that mean? The Bible talks about, you remember when the Bible talks about Jesus was saying, he that wants to gain his higher eternal spiritual life must lose his lower earthly life. In other words, if you want the high life of God, you got to give up the low life of the earth. And what happens then is you're submitting yourself to God and you're giving up living by a carnal nature and you're going to serve God by the spirit, which means then that you're actually humbling your spirit and your soul and bringing your soul into subjection to prostrate itself before God and honor God and worship God and love God and live for God according to his truth which is the truth of God, which is the word of God. So that means then you're going to serve God by the way that God wants you to serve him, not by the way that you think you ought to serve him or that the world says you can serve him or that uh, the devil tries to get you to serve him. There's only one way to serve God and that's through the word. And so we see this is what the Bible is talking about. Oh, come on, get back into this and see what the word is saying here. It says here, God is a spirit. And since God is a spirit, then the Bible says that they must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now we, we're going to get into this because I want you to see something. When you are worshiping God and reverencing God, you're, you're paying homage to him and you're honoring him and you're giving him his due. Now, an, another thing that happens here and, and look at what the Bible says, it says for they that worship him or that they prostrate him and that those that, that honor him and bless him and, and, and sing to him and worship him, they must worship him in spirit and in truth. In essence, what that is talking about to worship the Lord in spirit means that you yield yourself to the spirit of God and then you honor God and you prostrate yourself before God by being led by the Holy Spirit. So you need to see this now. Notice now he says you must, he is seeking those. And he said, they must worship him. They must worship him in spirit, in the spirit. You must be led by the spirit, the spirit of God and in truth, the word of God. Jesus says Thy word. Oh God is truth. The word of God will, anytime you're worshiping God, your worship must line up with and never contradict the word. That's why you can't take secular music and bring it into the church and then begin to sing that and think that you're praising and worshiping God. You know what that's like? That's like if God said, okay, David, I want you to go kill Goliath. But before you uh, go kill Goliath, I want you to go see Goliath and I want you to talk to him. And I want you and Goliath to collaborate on some, wor some worship songs so that y'all can write some worship songs to me. So Goliath, I want Goliath to take out of his Philistine spirit, that, that, that idol worshiping uh, religion that he has. And I want him to give you some input into the new worship songs that I want you to. Uh, 
uh, David, to bring to me, because I want you to be able to collaborate with the world so that you can make this, this, this new worship that I'm getting, that it'll, it'll be, it'll be acceptable to the Philistines as well as to the Israelites. The devil is a liar. God never did that. Well, then why are we going to Goliath? And why are our musicians going to Goliath and collaborating with them and writing worship songs and praise songs and writing songs to cross over into the secular realm and get the world and the, get the, the accolades from the world who don't love God, who don't obey God, who don't serve God. You see, you need to understand worship is living by the word and worship is obeying God by yielding to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never tell you to go and take that which is of the world and bring it into God and give it to him as sacrifice. Never will he do that because that goes against his holiness and it goes against his word. And so we need to see that and we need to understand that we are to worship God. We are to obey God because worship also means to obey God. And I'm going to, in the next, uh, uh, probably for the rest of tonight's message, I'm going to be sharing with you about the different ways that God can be worshiped. And you need to understand something here because we cannot just relegate worship to slinging, singing slow songs, you know, in that, you know, 20 minute worship uh, session in the church service that they have. And then after that 20 minutes of, of, of praise and worship is over, then that, that's it. No, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about serving God, honoring God, obeying God, prostrating your body and your spirit and your soul before God and obeying and yielding yourself to God so that God takes your full life service. And that life service is being given to God as you're being led by the Holy Spirit to do it the way God wants you to do it. This is what God is talking about, and this is what God wants you and I to know. Praise God. All right, now, so we're going to talk about worshiping, worshiping God. So as we're saying, is tithing worship to God? Sure it is, because tithing is how you live. Tithing is how you give. And we're going to get into this a little later. But now let's go on. There's another form of worship. And I want you to see this. There's another form of worship. Do you know that teaching the truth, teaching the truth is worship. Teaching the word of truth is worshiping God. See, a lot of people don't realize that worship not only goes from singing, but also it goes to teaching and preaching, but it has to be teaching and preaching the truth. So let's get into the word and see how does teaching truth, how is that worship? Well, I'm glad you asked. Come on, let's go to Mark chapter seven. In Mark chapter seven, let's take a look and see what the word of God says here as we're talking about worship and it's teaching the truth. In Mark chapter seven, looking at verse one, the Bible says, then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, they don't eat or eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. Notice what they're doing. They're holding the tradition or the lifestyle of the elders. Verse 4. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. So they don't eat unless they wash their hands. When they come from the market, they won't eat unless they wash their hands. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. So they're more concerned about washing and, and washing things and cleansing things with soap and water. Look at verse 5. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders? So they want to know why the disciples of Jesus are not operating like the tradition or the lifestyle of the elders, but they eat bread with unwashing hands. Now listen to what Jesus says. He answered and said unto them, 
Well have Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. Notice that, hypocrites, one who professes one thing, but they do or live the opposite. He said, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this prophet, this people, honoreth me with their lips, but their heart, oh, come on and listen to what the word says, their heart is what? Far from me. Their heart is far from me. And then notice this, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. How be it in vain do they worship me? How do they worship him? Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now he says that's vain worship. Remember when we were talking about the true worshipers that worship him in spirit and in truth, the true worshipers that do not lie. Well, here Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees and he's saying, how be it in vain do they worship me teaching? So they're worshiping by teaching, but they're teaching the wrong thing. They're teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Let's keep on going and see what else he says for laying aside the commandment of God. Notice, laying aside the commandment of God. Notice, God said, worship him in spirit and in truth, but they're laying aside the word. And it says, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, full well yet, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. They would rather do their own tradition or their own lifestyle instead of submitting to the word of God. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. I'll, I'll explain that verse to you in a second. Then he said in verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition or your lifestyles, which you have delivered and many such like things do ye. Notice now, Jesus is talking to them and he is rebuking them because here they, what they are doing now is they are teaching doctrines of tradition of the commandments of men. This is what, what, what the Lord is saying. So he's saying you all are more concerned about living out your traditions than obeying my word. Because see, true worshipers, what do we find out that the word worship means? It means to obey God and to live that life that God has prepared for us to live. So now here, they're not living that life because they are teaching traditions of men and they have put aside God's word. So they're not obeying the word, yet the word says they are teaching for doctrines. They are teaching, they are worship him by teaching doctrines of the commandments of men. Teaching the word, listen to what I'm saying. Teaching God's word in truth is pure, a pure form of worship preaching and teaching the word. So we need to understand something here that the worship service on a Sunday or a Tuesday or a Thursday or Friday, or whenever you go to what we call church, the whole service is worship. See, the whole service is worship. I, you know, we, 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 we get too caught up with talking about, and now it's time for praise and worship. Well, it was time for praise and worship when you woke up in the morning before you even got out of the bed because living for God is true praise and true worshiping God. Because if you're not living right, then when you go to that section of the service where it's time to sing fast songs to praise God and slow songs to worship God, none of that's going above the ceiling because your lifestyle, your obedience, you're, you're serving God in a lie. 
You're not serving him in truth because if you were serving him in truth and if I was serving him in truth, then we would be obeying the word so that when we do sing and, and, and sing songs unto God, he would receive them, but he can't receive them because we're being disobedient in our lifestyle. We're rejecting the word. Then we want to give him some music and, and let's just let the music gloss over all of the sin that we're doing. It does not work that way. I'm sorry to let you know. And I want you to understand something. Worship. You need to understand. Listen to what I'm sharing with you right now. See, what has happened is there are people in the body of Christ that are trying to elevate worship over the word of God. That's why you have in some churches that the musicians and especially the keyboard players and the and the and the, and the praise and worship team, they're exercising more authority in the church than sometimes even the pastor or the leader of the church is because people are really coming to church to get entertained. And therefore we find even churches are hiring praise and worship leaders that don't even, that are not even members of their church and they're getting them to come and to do, you know, 15, 20, 30 minute segments of songs. Then they pay them. Then they can leave and go and leave out of the service. How many times have you seen uh, going to church and you, you see the keyboard player, come on somebody. And as you know, when the, uh, the, 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 the service after the choir sings, the keyboard player gets up and walks out. He may go down in the basement or they may go out outside or whatever. And they don't come back into the service until it's time for the pastor to start hooping. And not once the, the service is starting to get real hot and the pastor started hooping, then here comes the keyboard player sitting back on the keyboard. Go, oh, glory to God. And they sit back on the keyboard so that they can back the pastor up while he's preaching or uh, when he's, you know, when he's tuning up and hooping. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. Why weren't you in the service when the word was going forth? And there are a lot of ministers of music and musicians that will leave the church. They're not concerned about the word as long as they can play and they can entertain the people. This is not worship. And so we understand. Let me let oh Let me share with you a, a, a scenario, a real true st scenario of what happened when music was trying to be instituted to gloss over the rebellion of God's commandment. You remember when God had given Moses the uh, the the instructions of building the tabernacle, and you remember how when the the uh, tabernacle was being built, He gave him instructions on how to build the Ark of the Covenant. And, and how they were to build the Ark of the Covenant was after the Ark was made, then they made two staves. And those staves were to go through the rings, the golden rings that were on each side of the uh, of the Ark. And they was, the staves would go through the, the rings so that when the Ark would be carried, the Ark would never be touched by men. The Ark would be carried and they would pick the Ark up with the staves and then they would put the staves on the shoulders of the priest who would then walk with the staves of the shoulders of the priest as they transferred the Ark of the Covenant to wherever they were going. You need to understand that. Now, what had happened was this was so interesting is because Israel had been disobeying God and, 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 and they'd fallen into captivity. The Ark had been stolen. And now David has gone to find the Ark. And finally, they get the Ark back. And now they're ex so excited about the ark. And so now, the, the, now remember what the word of God taught them, which they have for years not followed, because first of all, the ark was in captivity. Second of all, they didn't even realize what the word said about how the ark was to be handled, which represented God's presence with the people of God, that would, when his presence was with them, he would bless them and he would give them victory over their enemies. Well, now, David going out with the army, they've gotten the, 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 the ark back and they're very excited. And so now they're going to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. When they get the ark and so because they did not study how the ark was supposed to be carried, so they were gonna disobey the word of God. What they did was they built, watch this now, a cart. And they took an, a cart with wheels on it and they tied oxen to the cart. And then they picked up the ark and put the ark on the cart. Now that is not the way God said that ark was supposed to be carried. 
supposed to be carried through the staves on the shoulders of the priest. So now they're walking back toward Jerusalem and they're singing and dancing and singing the worship songs of God and praising God. And the ark is, you know, they're, they're going before the ark singing and praising and they're carrying the ark on a cart, a wooden cart carried by oxen. Come on, somebody, listen to what I'm saying. How are you going to carry the glory of God with some animals? How are you going to carry the glory of God, the presence of God, the representation of his presence, the holy ark of the covenant, and you're going to carry it with oxen on a, on a cart, on a wooden cart? God said it's, the ark was so precious that it could only be carried up on the shoulders of anointed and consecrated priests. And even then, they couldn't touch it. They could just only pick up the, the staves or the, 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 the poles that were through it and put it on their shoulders. Well, now, let's take a look and see what happens. Because this angered God so much. Now, watch what happens. That God caused the oxen to stumble. And when the oxen stumbled because they were trying to carry the glory of God, which an animal can't carry because God's glory is greater than any animal on earth. And so the oxen stumble and the cart was about to tip over. And so then the priest ran and caught the ark with his hand so that it wouldn't fall to the ground. Now, remember now, the people are praising and singing worship songs to God and honoring God. So they're singing the worship. But yet then they're, they're being disobedient to the word of how the ark is to be carried. So when the priest catches the ark, the Bible said it angered God and God killed the priest right there and he killed him. Now, notice what happens now. David sees the priest has been killed because he touched the ark and now they're confused because here they they thought they had the ark and they were worshiping and praising God. Why did God kill the priest? And the people were terrified. They had to even go back and find out how was the ark supposed to be carried before they could actually bring that ark into the place where God wanted it to be back to Jerusalem. But they had to find out by going back through the scriptures and finding out, oh, the priest was supposed to carry it. We've been disobeying God's word. Yet here we're going to sing worship and praise songs as we're carrying the ark, thinking that the worship and the praise is going to cover over their disobedience to the commandments of God. This is what's going on in the church. We got all kind of evil and sin and wickedness going going on in the church. And we think we can just gloss that over by singing some praise and worship songs and getting somebody that can sing with runs and riffs and get people all, all hyped up. There's nothing wrong with singing like that, but I'm telling you it better be unto the Lord and not for entertainment. And so what happens now is this is what we're presenting to God. And so we need to understand worship is a lifestyle that we must have. And so when we're talking about this, Oh, I'm telling you the power of God is so, is so, it, it, it is so powerful that when we are walking in this, you need to understand how God's truth is working. We have to worship God the way God wants us to worship him. And I'm trying to tell you, God is teaching us truth, teaching truth, teaching the word. What were they doing? What was, was the Pharisees doing? They were teaching, they were worshiping God by teaching the commandments of men instead of the word of God. And so we need to understand worship is teaching the word of God and, 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 and living by the word of God. That's a form of worship. That's how worship operates. All right. Now, what else does worship do? Or what else is worship, uh, that we might find and see worship is also watch this. Now worship is in giving offerings. Another way that we can worship God is by giving offerings unto the Lord giving offerings, actual financial offerings unto the Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter two. In Matthew chapter two, verses one through two, and then verses 10 and 11, let's go back. You remember when the Magi came and they were going to worship the Lord? Let's take a look at verse one. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem 
saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to what? We have come to worship him. We have come to worship him. Now let's see what kind of worshiping him they do. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down. You remember when we talked about worship is prostrating yourself and they worshiped him. They fell down. They prostrated him themselves and they began to bless the Lord. They worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So they fell down and worshiped him and gave gifts unto him. So we see now that worshiping and giving all offerings, you can worship God through giving offerings. It is imperative that we understand giving offerings, paying your tithes is an, is an avenue and it is a part of worshiping God. Come on and listen to what I'm saying. So if in fact giving is worship, and then you're going to teach and preach that tithing is under the law and that we don't have to tithe anymore. Then what you're saying is you don't have to worship God anymore because tithing is worshiping God. And if you reject that part, then you've rejected the whole thing. So you can do everything else you think is worship. If you're not tithing and we're going to see what the Lord says about that. If you don't tithe, then guess what happens? You're robbing God of his worship. And there are consequences to that. We need to see something here. God has taught us and he's teaching us and telling us how he wants us to worship him. And he's showing us different scenarios of how to worship him. We ought to worship him by prostrating ourselves, spirit, soul, and body before him. We ought to worship him in our lifestyles and serving him and living by his word. We ought to worship him by teaching the Bible and preaching the truth. That's worshiping God. Now we see that we ought to worship God by giving, giving offerings unto the Lord. And that's what they did. The, 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 the Magi, they gave the offerings unto the Lord. This is a part of worship. This is how God is working. Now, let's show you another way of worshiping. Now we're going to go to the flip side of worshiping and see something else. Watch this because this is very interesting. Satan wants worship through your obedient lifestyles. See, we, we talked about worship is being obedient to God and obedient to his word. But now notice Satan wants worship through obedient lifestyles. So he wants you to worship him through your obedient lifestyle or that you would obey him and obey what he tells you to do. That's what Satan wants to do here. He wants to make you worship him by obeying his command. Let's go to Luke chapter four. And in Luke chapter four, let's take a look at verse one. It says, and Jesus being full of the Holy ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness being 40 days tempted of the devil. You see that being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now you need to understand something. If the devil is going to tempt Jesus and come after Jesus, do you think he thinks he has a chance by coming after you? If he came after Jesus, you know, he's coming after you. And the same way that he came after Jesus, he's going to come after you with the same tactics that he used on Jesus. All right, let's get back and let's see what actually the devil did uh, by coming and asking Jesus some questions here. All right, now, now take a look at here. It says, and being full of the Holy Ghost, he returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, come on somebody and listen to what the word says. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. 
And the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it may be made bread. What is he saying here? He's trying to get Jesus to obey his commandment. He said, if you the son of God, command that stone to be made bread. So the devil was trying to tell him, obey me, because when you obey me, or when you submit to my commands, you're actually worshiping me. He wants worship. All right. So he says, command a stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answering him said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So Jesus comes back to the devil and he rebukes him with the word. And what he does is he tells them that I am not, listen, why? I don't live by bread alone, but I live by every word of God. I don't live by your words. I don't obey your words. You need to see this. You need to understand that. You need to see this and you need to see this clearly. You are not to live by Satan's commandments. You are to live by the word of God. As soon as you obey Satan, you have become his servant. You are now prostrating yourself. You are in obedience to the devil, which means you are serving him and obeying him. And when you do that, you have given over the reins of your life to Satan and snatched the reins of your life away from the Lord. I want you to get this. So Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God. What did the devil do? Jesus was hungry, right? So what he comes and he tempts him with is in the thing in which he is suffering. He is suffering hunger. And so then the devil says, I have a solution to your hunger. Now, if you do what I tell you, you can alleviate your hunger. See, that's what the devil does. Once he finds there's something that you have a lack of, or there's something that you need in your life, he comes to you and he gives you a commandment to do what he tells you to do in order to get it. When in essence, all you got to do is obey the word of God and God will bring into your life the very things that you need. For the Bible says, for my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Bible says that the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God wants you blessed. He will bring the blessings to you. And so you don't have to obey the devil and listen to the devil in order to get what God wants you to have. Come on and let's take a look and see what else this particular verse of scripture says, because Satan is really, really, really trying Jesus. And so it says here, in verse five, and the devil taking, watch this now, the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thy serve. Notice what Jesus says to him. The devil says, all of the kingdoms of the world. He shows them all the kingdoms of the world, but notice in a moment of time, this is how Satan operates. He shows you what you think are the joyful and the blessed things of the world, but he shows it to you in a moment of time. This is what he did to Jesus. He showed him all the kingdoms in a moment of time. Notice it said he showed him all the kingdoms, but he didn't show him the slums. He didn't show him all the, 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 the destitute places. He just showed him the kingdoms. This is what the devil does. He always tries to highlight sin and he always tries to highlight his thing and keep you not watching out for the rest of the story. Notice what he says. He showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That's a spirit of rush. That's a spirit of rush. You ever noticed how when people are trying to get you to do something and they really don't want you to check it out, they say, oh, just go ahead and sign it. Just, just sign it. Oh, it ain't nothing. Just go on and sign it. And people are trying to rush you into doing things. Why do you think people are trying to rush you into doing things? It's because they don't want you to search out to find out all of the lies and the hidden clauses that will cause you to be in bondage. This is what the devil was trying to do with Jesus. He was trying to make Jesus, watch this now, serve him. 
by offering Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world. Now, isn't it interesting the devil's trying to offer Jesus something that Jesus already owns? Jesus created all the kingdoms of the world. This is how the devil does. But see, the devil is so, he's, he believes his lies so much that he even thinks he could deceive Jesus. Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And all things were, were, uh, uh, were made by him and was not anything made that was not made by him. And so we need to understand Jesus made everything. So now here Satan is trying to get Jesus to, 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 to worship him, to bow down, notice to worship him, to prostrate himself spiritually, physically, and mentally, and to obey that command. But Jesus says, thou shalt worship the Lord uh, thy God and him only shalt thou serve. What Jesus was saying here is Satan, you and I are standing, you standing here in front of me and you're looking at me. Now I'm telling you that you shall worship the Lord your God. I'm the Lord your God. You're going to worship me. I'm the Lord your God. I made you and you don't have any authority over me and him only shalt thou serve. So he rebuked Satan and put him in his place. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? But what was Satan after? He was after Jesus's lifestyle, the lifestyle of obeying what the devil wants him to do. All right, let's get back into this and see what else he asked him. Now watch this. And Jesus answered and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. I am the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the Bible says in verse nine, and he brought him, watch this now, he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest thou at any time dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, don't tempt me. I'm the Lord, your God. Now this time when Jesus said that, and then the Bible said, and when the devil had ended all them temptations, he departed from him for a season. Well, I guess so, because now Jesus has put the command on him. Here the devil comes and he tempts Jesus. And he tempts Jesus in all three areas of temptation. You remember what the word of God says? He says, you remember what God's word said? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the pride of life. Come on, are you, are you listening to what I'm saying? The lust of the flesh, number one. Number two, the lust of the eyes. And number three, the pride of life. And he said, they are not of the Father, but they are of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. So there are three ways that the devil will always come to tempt you. There are only three ways that he can tempt you. And these are the three ways that he used on Jesus. He will use them on you. And the reason why he keeps using it, he doesn't change his tactics. You want to know why? Because they've been working ever since Adam and Eve sinned against God. And he'd been working on men and women every single day, ever since Adam and Eve gave that authority over. So now, lust of the flesh, command the stones to be made bread since you're hungry. That's the lust of your flesh. That's when your body is craving something. And therefore, the devil gives you something to satisfy that craze. Lust of the eyes. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You see, I'll show you, I'll show you all the kingdoms of the world and I'll let you see it. Lust of the eyes, pride of life. You're the son of God. Go on and jump off this temple. He said he'd give you his angels charge over you and they'd bear you up in, the, in their hands unless you dash your, your foot against a stone. Prove yourself. You the, you're the proud one. And so he's trying to tempt him with the pride of life. But every time Jesus comes back and he rebukes him with the word of God. And when he does that, then the devil has to back off. This is what Jesus is, is, is getting you to understand and getting you and I to see. So that the devil is actually uh, seeking Watch this now. You see, Satan wants worship through your obedient lifestyle. He wants worship through your obedient lifestyle. 
And so we see how the word of God is moving and we see how the word of God is blessing us. God is causing you and I to walk in the revelation of his power. He's causing us to walk in the revelation of his truth and he's causing us to walk in the revelation of his spirit. We've got one more that we want to share with you today when we're also talking about worship. There's another way of worshiping God. Another way that we worship God is through singing. We worship God through singing. Now, this is very interesting, and, and you're going to see this, and, and I want to go through this, and then we'll close on this particular uh, area here, and then we'll pick up next week uh, when we'll, we'll show you how tithing is robbing God of his worship when you don't tithe. But we'll pick that up next, uh, next Thursday. But let's finish this up today. Worship through singing. How you worship God is through singing. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter five, God is showing us worship. Now, the reason why I'm spending so much time on worship is because you need to understand that tithing is worship. Giving is worship. And you need to see that worship is tied in with giving, but it is also wrapped up every other area of our lives. Now here, we are to worship God through singing. Now notice what the Bible says here in Ephesians chapter five, verse 17. This is very interesting here. And I'm telling you, it's going to bless some people. He says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. So God's word says that it is possible to understand God's will. You know, people in church, and I've heard it for years, uh, growing up in the church. Oh, you never know what the Lord's going to do. Oh, his wonders to perform. You just don't know what God's going to do. Well, yes, you can. And as a matter of fact, we're going to see in this verse of scripture how God really feels about people that don't understand his will. <laughs> and I'm going to guarantee you, it might, it might shock you to see what God's word says about people that do not understand his will. All right, let's get back and let's see what does the Bible say here about understanding his will. Wherefore be ye not unwise. That word unwise, that word aphron, A-P-H-R-O-N, that word aphron, it comes from two words, a meaning without and friend meaning understanding. It means to be unwise. It means to be imprudent. It means to be inconsiderate. But most of all, watch this now, this word means to be foolish. So God says, when you don't understand my will, you're foolish. He's actually calling people fools. He, he's actually saying it is a fool that does not understand the will of God. It is foolishness. It is unwise. It is imprudent when you don't understand my will. So that sounds like if you don't know the will of God, then you in a, you in a bad way with the Lord. And you're going to have to change some things in order for you to know what God wants you to do. Uh, let's get back here and see what it says here. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You can understand the will of the Lord. Now notice what he goes on to say. He says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. This is the revelation of God. It means that he wants you and I to be filled with the spirit, to be filled with the spirit. Play rude, being filled with the spirit. It means to make full and abundant supply, to imbue with something and richly be filled to overflowing to completion. And so when God is talking about being filled with the spirit, he's saying that I want you to have an abundant supply and oversupply that you are totally filled. You are totally uh, imbued with the spirit and abundant supply to overflowing. I want the spirit of God to take you over so that you are so full of him that your actions are his actions. Your thoughts are his thoughts. Your ways are his ways that he becomes your leader and your guider. 
and your teacher and your strengthener and your comforter and your helper and your advocate and your confidant and your empowerer and your revelator and your teacher and your guide. He becomes your healer. He is the Holy Spirit. And he wants you to be filled with, this is the will of God, that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the, when it talks about being full of the Holy Spirit, it is really sharing with you because a lot of times, and what has happened is, because we talk about the initial evidence of someone being filled with the Holy Spirit, we find out in the book of, of Acts chapter two, verse four, when the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak with other tongues. And then we find in Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 36, that when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak with other tongues and prophesy. Again, in Acts chapter 19, verse 6, they began, to, uh, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they prophesied. And so we need to understand that when a person is initially filled with the Holy Spirit, one of the evidences that a person has been filled with the Holy Spirit is they will begin to speak a brand new language that the Spirit of God gives them. It is called speaking with other tongues. Tongues. It is called speaking a supernatural language, a spiritual language that God gives you and he controls your tongue. Notice the first thing that happened in Acts chapter 2, 4, when the Holy Spirit came to the disciples, the first thing that the, the, the Holy Spirit did was take control of their tongues. Why? Because in, in James chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says that the tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It setteth on fire the course of nature and it itself is set upon fire of hell. He says the tongue can no man tame. And so we need to understand if you can control, control your tongue, you can control your body. But since we can't control our tongues, we can't control our bodies. And so God had to come in and take control of the tongue and give that tongue and make that tongue submit to the power of the Holy Ghost, where God taught them a supernatural language, even without them going to school. God did it supernaturally and instantly taking control of their tongue. He filled them with the Holy Ghost. To be filled with the Holy Ghost means to yield to the Holy Ghost so that you are obeying the Holy Ghost. And tongues is a gift of the Spirit. But just because you have, once you're filled with the Holy Ghost, he's giving you those tongues. He's giving you the ability to speak. But let me tell you something. You can start being disobedient to God and not yielding to the Holy Ghost because see, to the degree that you yield to the spirit is to the degree that you're filled with the spirit. Well, you're either filled or you're not. So you're either yielding to the Holy Ghost or you're not. And what happens is when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, we always just relegate that off to somebody speaking in tongues. And then they'll also always say when they're praying for somebody to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And then when they start speaking, it's all oh, you got. You got it. You got it. You got it. And, and, and they're calling the Holy Ghost an it. The Holy Ghost is God. He is not an it. He is the most disrespected uh, person of the Godhead. He is the only one. We don't call God it. We don't call Jesus it. So why do we call the Holy Ghost it or something? Something told me. You know, no, 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 no. We have to respect and honor the Holy Spirit because Jesus sent him to us as the another comforter. And he was to take the place of Jesus to infill us so that we could walk in the power and the revelation of God. So now we find he wants us to be filled. So once you are filled with the Holy Spirit and yielding to the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit can release his wisdom, his understanding, his power and his glory and his might into your life. Let's see what else happens when you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Watch this now. It says in verse 19, he says, speaking to yourselves. Now this is what you're going to do. This is how you're worshiping God here. He says, you're going to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is how God wants you and I to worship him. He, he wants us in singing. He wants us to worship him in psalms in hymns and in spiritual songs. The Psalms, 
Psalms are the Psalms, the actual, the book of Psalms, singing the Psalms, singing the, uh, the verses in the Psalms and putting it to music, playing it with stringed instruments, singing the very Psalms of God. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about Psalms. It is the, the, work, the book of Psalms and putting it to music and singing that to God. Those are Psalms that are giving God honor and they're giving God uh, worship through the Psalms itself. Then there are the hymns of God. And the hymns are songs that are in honor of God, where we're actually honoring God and we're singing songs that honor him. We're singing songs that, that, that bring God glory. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what happens is where the, the, the Psalms sing of, of man's deliverance and his, his mercies uh, that God gives us, whereas the hymns, they, they declare that God is magnificent. And we talk about how great he is in the hymns. Now notice this, these, these hymns that we sing and the hymns that we sing, they have three characteristics about them. And the three characteristics of the hymns or the songs about the magnificence and the glory and the, and, and the power of God is that the songs must be, first of all, they must be sung. Those are hymns. They have to be sung in order to be a hymn. And then they must praise God. That's number two. And then number three, the song must be to God. Oh, come on, somebody. The song must be to God. So we have to watch this now. We have to sing the song and then we have to praise God. And the song has to be to God. Notice the song is to God, not to your boyfriend, to God, not to your partners, to God, Th these hymns. And then it says, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Spiritual songs are songs that are directed by the Holy Spirit. These are songs that come from the Holy Spirit and he releases those songs to you, those melodies to you, those words to you. Spiritual songs are songs that are played with instruments. And so he is releasing the music and the singing of the songs through you. He is anointing. So then the songs come from the Holy Spirit. They don't come from your head. They don't come from you collaborating with worldly singers to try to get the pot right on the song. No, these songs come from the spirit of God. And so when God teaches us that we are to worship him in song, our worshiping God in song are songs that are directed completely by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the songs that we sing. We don't take secular songs that were not created to praise God. Remember the songs have got to be sung. They have got to watch this now. And they have to praise God and they have to be about God. Are y'all understanding what the word is saying here? And so we need to understand uh, these songs have to be sung and they have to praise God and they have to be about him. Our music only is supposed to be about him and we ought to worship him as Christians. Notice that our worshiping God is in spirit and in truth, it is through the spirit that is in line with the word. And you never see in the Bible where people are using secular music to bring God worship. That was tried one time. And that's when Israel, when Moses had gone up into the mountain and God was giving him the 10 commandments. And when Israel saw that Moses hadn't come down, they began to get very edgy and angry with Moses because he was taking too long. And so they, 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 they got with Aaron and, and psyched Aaron out and they put in all their earrings and their gold and everything else. And they burned it and melted it down. And then they built themselves a cow, a calf, a molten calf. And they built them a cow and they worshiped it. And they began to dance and sing and so Moses came down and Moses said, I hear a sound of war and notice now. So singing secular music in order to honor God is actually war against God. 
because God doesn't want anything. That's why I talked about Goliath can't be making a song with David and then bringing it to God for worship. Singing to God is to take the songs that are inspired by the Holy Ghost, anointed by the Holy Ghost, and released by the Holy Ghost through you so that when you sing the songs, you are singing them by the power of the Holy Ghost and not by trying to imitate and mimic somebody else's runs and riffs in order to get applause from the audience, but you're being led by the Spirit. And if the Holy Ghost leads you to sing like that, if he's anointed you to sing like that, fine. But don't be trying to put on an act in a show because you have just taken the worship of God and turned it into carnality, which God hates. And then your song doesn't go above the ceiling. I pray that you've been blessed by the message today. I pray that you've been blessed by the word because we're, we're sharing with you prosperity God's way. And I want you to know, as we close tonight, every way that you worship God, ushers you into the presence of God for prosperity. When you worship God and you worship him through your lifestyle, when you worship him through your music, when you worship him through your teaching and your preaching, when you're worshiping him through your giving, it ushers you into the realm of God prospering you because prosperity is the direct result of worshiping God. Praise God. I pray this word has been a blessing to you tonight. It has blessed me. I preach myself happy. I've gotten excited about the word. Well, praise God. I want you all to be blessed and I want you all to stay uh, focused on the things of God because God is taking us to different levels of his spirit and his anointing. Keep studying the word, praying, get revelation knowledge, understand what God is saying, and then live by it. And don't allow the devil to tempt you and to get you away from serving God and from serving his word. We all need the Holy Ghost. And so praise God. We just thank the Lord for you all uh, watching with us today. And I pray that you'll continually be blessed in the name. All of you all that are on the Zoom call, after I close out uh, this broadcast, I want you to stay on the Zoom call because I want to uh, be able to talk to you and we want to have prayer. So all of you that are on the Zoom call, don't, don't hang up yet. As soon as I uh, close out the broadcast, then I want you uh, to stay online and then we're going to talk after that. Praise the Lord. So I want you to understand God is moving by his spirit and he's going to teach us prosperity his way so that you don't have to apologize when God begins to bless you. Well, remember these words that the Lord said uh, to us in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. He said, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And the Bible teaches us that the devil is defeated. God is exalted and Jesus is Lord. God bless you. God keep you. Keep looking to the glory of God for God truly has exalted you by his his power and by his word. We'll talk to you next Thursday as we continue to go on with prosperity, God's way. Be blessed in Jesus name.